Chapter 10, War of the Flea by Robert Tabor. Sun Tzu on the Art of War, Principles of Guerrilla Strategy and Tactics, Terrain as a Determining Factor, Guerrilla War in Urban Areas, The Character of the Guerrilla. All warfare is based on deception. Therefore, when capable, feign incapacity. When active, inactivity. When near, make it appear that you are far away. When far away, that you are near. Offer the enemy a bait to lure him. Feign disorder and strike him. When he concentrates, prepare against him. Where he is strong, avoid him. Anger his general and confuse him. Pretend inferiority and encourage his arrogance. Keep him under a strain and wear him down. When he is united, divide him. Attack where he is unprepared. Sally out when he does not expect you. These are the strategist's keys to victory. The quotation above is taken from Sun Tzu's essays on the art of war, the oldest known writing on the subject, predating the Christian era by several centuries. The striking resemblance to the military axioms of Mao Zedong is no coincidence. Mao has studied Sun Tzu, thoroughly and acknowledges his debt. Many of the Chinese guerrilla leaders' dicta are, in fact, mere paraphrases of those of the art of war. Sun Tzu is quoted here to make a point. It is that modern warfare is, in its most common usage, a cant phrase, indicated of the confusion, indicative of the confusion of journalists and politicians who mistake technology for science. For despite the impressive technological innovations of the 20th century, the principles of warfare are not modern but ancient. They were well established when Caesar marched out and on his first campaign. And what is true of war in general is even more true, if possible, of guerrilla warfare in particular. Aircraft and artillery provide weapons of far greater range than the longbow. Explosives formidably multiply the striking power of the arrow. Tanks are better than shields. Trucks and helicopters offer, but not always, swifter and more dependable transportation than mules and camels. The problems of generalship remain the same. The variable factors of terrain, weather, space, time, population, and above all, of morale and strategy still determine the outcome of battles and campaigns. If there is anything new about guerrilla war, of which Sun Tzu is surprisingly Sun Tzu surprisingly anticipates by 2,000 years virtually all questions of a military nature, it is only in its modern political application. To put it another way, the specifically modern aspect of guerrilla warfare is in its use as a tool of political revolution. The single sure method by which an unarmed population can overcome mechanized armies or failing to overcome them can stalemate them and make them irrelevant. To understand how this comes about does not require a study of military tactics so much as the political problems to which military methods, guerrilla methods, may provide a solution. The guerrilla is a political insurgent, the conscious agent of revolution. His military role, while vital, is only incidental to his political mission. His insur insurgency is dedicated to a single purpose, the overthrow of the government and the destruction of the existing political or social or, it may be, economic system. In the process of accomplishing his goal, he may have to defeat, and he will certainly have to engage and outmaneuver, organized professional military forces. If so, however, his maneuvers, except where immediate survival is at stake, will be undertaken primarily for their political effect. Each battle will be a lesson, designed to demonstrate the imp impotence of the army and so to discredit the government that employs it. Each campaign will be a text, intended to raise the level of revolutionary awareness and anticipation of the popular majority whose attitude will determine the outcome of the struggle. Guerrilla actions will have certain obvious military objectives, to obtain weapons, ammunition, and supplies, to inflict casualties, to force the enemy to overextend his lines so that his communications may be disrupted and small units picked off, one at a time, by locally superior rebel forces. But psychological and political objectives will be paramount. Local military success will serve no purpose if the, if the guerrilla campaign does not also weaken the morale of the government and, the, and its soldiers. Strain the financial resources of the regime and increase political pressure on it by creating widespread apprehension and dissatisfaction with the progress of a war in which there is no progress and no end in sight. Obviously, none of this can occur except in the presence of certain distinct social and political conditions, which combine to produce a potentially revolutionary situation. Successful insurgency presupposes the existence of valid popular grievances, sharp social divisions, an unsound or stagnant economy, and oppressive government. These factors obtaining revolution will still be far off, unless there exists or comes into existence the nucleus of a revolutionary organization, capable of articulating and exploiting popular dissatisfaction with the status quo. Ordinarily, however, 
revolutionary situations produce their own revolutionary leadership. Coming from the most unstable social sectors, it can be expected to include the most radical, most frustrated, and ambitious elements of the political out parties. The more idealistic and least successful members of the middle class and those most outraged by the unaccustomed pinch of oppression. The long tyrant the long tyrannized peasant, for example, is seldom as revolutionary as the relatively fortunate student or worker who has been led to believe that he has rights and finds in a change of political climate that he is deprived of them. The long tyrannized peasant, for example, is seldom as revolutionary as the relatively fortunate student or worker who has been led to believe that he has rights and finds in a political, excuse me, and finds in a change of political climate that he is deprived of them. In the potentially revolutionary situation, spontaneous insurrections may be expected. They are likely to arise out of almost any sort of social conflict, a strike, an election campaign, a dispute over land or wages or prices or rents or schools or any of a score of other social problems. Often they will come in reaction to some act of repression or of real or francied injustice on the part of the governing authorities, as, for example, when the efforts of the police to curb a popular demonstration turn the demonstration into a riot. In other circumstances, disorder may be deliberately created. In Cuba, Algeria, Cyprus, as examples that come readily to the mind, readily to mind, the War of the Flea was initiated by the deliberate acts of the revolutionary nucleus, proclaiming its defiance of authority and banking on popular support in an open declaration of revolutionary war. The means are not important. The important element is the leadership itself. Bandits are not revolutionaries. Looters are not guerrillas. In order to attract a following, the revolutionary leaders must stand on firm moral ground. They must have some greater purpose than the furtherance of personal ambition. This, in turn, implies an ideology or a clear cause to explain their decisions and their reasons of their insurgency. They cannot be mere opportunists. When conflict occurs, whether spontaneous or induced, the revolutionary leaders must be capable of explaining and rationalizing its confused and often apparently accidental character. Isolated acts of defiance must be given coherency with a revolutionary frame of reference. The leadership must be prepared to to make the most of every opportunity to accelerate the process of social ferment and political disruption. The first task of the revolutionary caters must be to relate each incident and each phase of the conflict to a great cause, so that revolutionary violence is seen as the natural and moral means to a desired end, and the masses of the people are increasingly involved. The struggle cannot be allowed to seem meaningless or chaotic. It must be given a progressive character in all its phases. It must arouse great expectations and appear crucial at every stage, so that no one can stand outside of it. The precise cause itself is not of great consequence. One is often as good as another. In Cuba, for example, the corruption of the Batista regime and its illegitimacy were seemingly sufficient causes for the well-to-do middle class, so long as its members individually did not take any great personal risk, but merely sympathized with and abetted the act active revolutionaries. When the sons of the middle class were imprisoned or killed or tortured for their activities, oppression became the more urgent cause. Economic nationalism was the real cause of the rich and ambitious industrialists and entrepreneurs who opposed Batista. Political ambition, which could not be avowed, and a sense of social injustice, which could, were the causes that drove the frustrated youths of the poor white-collar class to become the caters and greatest zealots of the revolution. And on the other hand, the landless campesinos, the economically deprived macha, ma, macheteros, macheteros, not sure, M A C H E T E R O S, of the great sugar plantations, the squatters of the Sierra Maestra were driven by actual hunger, by real oppression, and by a longing for the security of land of their own under a just social system, motivations that transcended any question of moral or political causes. The nominal causes varied according to the local situation. The constant, consistent appeal of the revolutionary leadership was broader, being based on a democratic, egalitarian ideology linked to no notions of social justice long accepted in Cuba. There was nothing new about Castro's brand of humanism. It was written into the Cuban constitution and a clear political goal, the overthrow of the Batista regime and the complete destruction of, the, of, or, of, of or severance from everything that supported it. The overthrow of Batista was presented as a panacea, the remedy of all existing evils. 
as a cause, it related and made understandable each isolated political development, the assassination of a policeman, the martyrdom of a terrorist, the suspension of civil liberties or a public demonstration demanding their restoration, any disruption of the ordinary routine, anything that helped to undermine the regime, was held up as a skirmish or a battle in a great crusade. This state of mind prevailing, the process of cutting away Batista's support and increasing the pressure against him, both inside and outside of the country continued according to a pattern that we have already examined, examined in detail in earlier chapters. The Cuban example provides as well as any other the recipe for successful insurgency. The prerequisites are the following. 1. An unstable political situation marked by sharp social divisions and usually, but not always, by a foundering or stagnant economy. 2. A political objective based on firm moral and ideological grounds that can be understood and accepted by the majority as the overriding cause of the insurgency, desirable in itself and worthy of any sacrifice. 3. An oppressive government with which no political compromise is possible. 4. Some form of revolutionary political organization capable of providing dedicated and consistent leadership toward the accepted goal. There is one final requirement, the clear possibility or even the po probability of success until people believe that a government can be overthrown and it must be the first act of the insurgency to demonstrate this possibility by successful defiance of military force. The attempt will not be made. The revolutionary following will not be found. The specific techniques or tactics of guerrilla warfare are not, except in unimportant detail, to be learned from texts. They relate always to the specific local situation are, and are supremely expedient. The guerrilla is, above all, an improviser. The nature of his improv improvisation depends naturally on immediate and long-range objectives. The terrain, the relative strength of his forces and those of the enemy, the material means at his disposal, and similar factors. Since the guerrilla's numerical strength and arms are inferior to those of his enemy, or he would not be a guerrilla, and since his most immediate concern is mere survival, the basis of all guerrilla tactics is obviously evasion. Successful evasion means the ability to avoid confrontation except at one's own choosing, yet always to be able to achieve the local superiority to strike with effect. Quote, If I am able to determine the enemy's disposition, while at the same time I conceal my own, writes Sun Tzu, then I can concentrate and he must divide, and if I concentrate while he divides, I can use my entire strength to attack a fraction of his. End quote. And again, quote, the enemy must not know where I intend to give battle, for if he does not know where I, I intend to give battle, he must prepare in a great many places, and when he prepares in a great many places, those I have to fight in any one place will be few. And when he prepares everywhere, he will be weak everywhere. The foregoing explains, as well as anything that has ever been written, how it is possible for a relative handful of armed men to oppose a vastly superior army. The secrets of success are first, superior intelligence and second, terrain. Guerrillas, representing a popular cause, have the tremendous advantage of an intelligence service that encompasses virtually the entire population. The population hides them, and at the same time it reveals, from day to day and hour to hour, the disposition and strength of the enemy. Quote, we always know where the soldiers are, Fidel Castro told me when I first interviewed him in the Sierra Maestra early in 1957. But they never know where we are. We can come and go as we like, moving through their lines, but they can never find us unless we wish them to, and then it is only on our terms. Footnote here, uh, Robert Tabor, The Biography of a Revolution. At the time, Castro had perhaps 100 guerrillas at his disposal. In theory, he was surrounded by some 5,000 Batista soldiers, but in the wild and trackless terrain of the Sierra Maestra, roaming, roaming over some 5,000 square miles of mountains and dense forest among the rural populace, surely sympathetic to him and hostile to, Bat to Batista, his being surrounded was an irrelevance. The ocean is surrounded, but the fish do not care. Where a choice of ground is possible, the terrain of guerrilla operations should be carefully selected. The ideal will be found in a country that is more rural than urban, mountainous rather than flat, thickly forested rather than bare, with extensive railway lines, bad roads, and an economy that is preponderantly agricultural rather than industrial. The relative dispersion or concentration of the population is also of great importance. A region with a widely scattered rural population living in small hamlets and isolated farm dwellings is much more vulnerable than one of tightly knit, large country towns separated by wide areas of open farmland. 
The terrain should afford both natural concealment and obstacles to hinder the movement of military transport. Mountains and swamps where tanks and trucks cannot go. Woods and thick brush that provide cover from aerial observation and attack. Forests from which to strike quickly and safely at enemy rail and highway communications and, which, and in which to ambush small military units. There should be sufficient space to maneuver freely, without the danger of being caught in a closing spiral of encirclement. The greater the area of operations, the more difficult it will be for the army to locate the guerrillas and the more the government will have to disperse its troops and extend its line of supply and communication. Yet the guerrillas cannot choose the remotest and most rugged areas in which they would be safest. They must remain constantly in contact with the rural population from which to recruit, to draw supplies, and to obtain reliable couriers who will carry messages and directions to and from the revolutionary underground in the towns and cities. This necessity indicates the choice of an area with a dispersed rather than concentrated rural population. Such an area will usually afford the natural concealment and natural obstacles to, an, to army operations found in desolate areas and will provide a further advantage. It will not be economic for the government to garrison. Large rural towns can be garrisoned, tiny hamlets cannot. Where there are many of them, only a few soldiers can be assigned to each, and to create such rural outposts is worse than useless, since each individual post can easily be overwhelmed. Its soldiers captured or killed, their arms and ammunition seized, and another propaganda victory thus scored by the insurgents. Since there will be no great government stake in any given hamlet, farm, or village, in economic or strategic terms, the natural decision of the army will be to withdraw to safer ground. Yet each such withdrawal will widen the area of guerrilla control and feed the insurgency, providing it with more supplies, more recruits, more room in which to maneuver. There is another consideration. The possession of populated areas will usually provide almost as much safety for the insurgents as would the remote areas in which they cannot be located or attacked. Political considerations, if not those of humanity, will usually offer some safeguard against bombing or artillery attacks, since the government cannot afford to kill civilians indiscriminately. Footnote here. Clearly this does, clearly this does not always hold. Consider Vietnam. Main text. The danger of being isolated far from populated areas has been demonstrated by the experience of guerrillas in Malaya and the Philippines. In both instances, the military succeeded in isolating the insurgents, cutting them off from their source of strength with results fatal to the insurgency. On the other hand, the possibility of fighting a successful guerrilla war on a small island with little room to maneuver and no real wilderness sanctuary has been proven by the Cypriot fighters of the EOKA. When pressed, the small guerrilla bands commanded by Grievous in the hills of Cyprus would filter back into the towns. The known fugitives who could not do so lived like foxes in earthen dugouts so well camouflaged that British soldiers often walked above their heads without discovering them. Other allied, others allied forth on night forays from hiding places under the floors of homes where they had laid hidden. Others allied forth on night? I'm not sure what's going on with this sentence, but I'll read it exactly as it's written. Others allied forth on night forays from hiding places under the floors of homes where they had lain all day, their presence unsuspected. They were, in the most literal sense, underground. Even in well-policed large cities, a sympathetic population can protect active insurgents. The draconian methods used by the French in Algiers virtually stamped out the FLN underground there, but only because the Muslims of the Kasbah Kasbah were already separated, racially and physically, from the French population. Soldiers, especially foreigners, can suppress urban rebellion, as in Budapest, by treating the entire metropolis as a city under wartime siege, controlling all movements and ruthlessly killing the inhabitants of any quarter where resi resistance is offered. Gradually, an urban population can be starved and terrorized into submission, but such methods scarcely apply to the civil war situation in which there is no way, no sure way of knowing friend from foe. Terrain and local conditions ultimately decide the size and organization of the guerrilla band. In Cuba's Sierra Mestra, columns of 100 to 120 men proved best, such a force being competent to deal with any military group that might penetrate its base area. Greater numbers were unwieldy on the march and difficult to supply, given the resources of a very thinly populated region with a marginal agricultural economy. 
In more densely populated, more prosperous rural areas, a platoon of 30 to 40 men would occupy a hamlet or small village and its environs. Guard posts were established along the margins of the entire Territorio Libre, and the zone was administered as a state within a state. In suburban areas, on the other hand, concealment was the determining factor, and the guerrillas who worked close to the larger towns, interdicting the highways and cutting communications and power lines, operated in squads of three to eight men, striking from ambush, and then quickly hiding in the brush or, at times, in the homes of residents. Raids on suburban military posts and outlying industrial establishments were often made by commandos living within the town, who, c who would assemble for a night action and then quickly disperse to their homes to resume their normal daytime occupations. With respect to the conditions that prevail in most of the Latin American republics, Che Guevara considers that a nucleus of 30 to 50 armed men is sufficient to initiate a guerrilla insurgency with good assurance of success. If the nucleus, organized and armed in strictest secrecy, exceeds 150, it should be divided, and the action begun in two regions well apart. When an active guerrilla column grows beyond 100 or so, it should again be divided and action begun on a new front. There is a positive as well as a negative reason for this division. The guerrillas are missionaries. Their task is not merely to oppose the army, but to spread rebellion among the people. And the wider their area of contact with the population, the better for their cause. The guerrilla nucleus initiates the conflict, if possible, on the edge of a wilderness sanctuary, in a thinly populated agricultural area with a marginal economy, within easy striking distance of strategic targets, railway lines that can be cut, communications that can be disrupted, mining or industrial plants that can be sabotaged, small military or police posts from which arms can be seized. At the same time, urban insurrection of a hit-and-run rather than sustained character is created by the revolutionary underground, so as to give the insurgency a general national complexion for maximum propaganda effect. It is not enough to rebel. The rebellion must be the object of national attention, too shocking in its initial effects to be ignored by even a controlled press, or quickly explained away, as has been the case with many abortive provincial insurrections, by a government safe in an untroubled capital far from the scene of battle. When the first excitement has died away and order has been restored in the towns where uprisings have occurred, the guerrillas can expect the army to bring the battle to them. They will not have to seek it. The government will order a bandit suppression campaign. Troops will be dispatched by motor convoy or airlift to the region of reported guerrilla activity. Spotter planes will skim the treetops, seeking the insurgents. Soldiers will occupy the villages and patrol the roads. Foot columns will penetrate deeply into rebel territory, trying to make contact. Helicopters may be used to ferry troops to strategic encampments deep in the forest or mountains from which patrols can fan out in search of the rebels. If the military commander knows what he is about, he may adopt some variation of the French oil slick technique, gridding the region on his map and attempting to clear it a square at a time, driving the guerrillas slowly toward a prepared killing zone, or zones where their only apparent route of escape will bring them into the open much as tigers are driven by beaters into the guns of the hunters. The oil slick method is theoretically sound, but in practice it is far from foolproof. Since it is a rare government that can admit serious concern over the activities of a small band of guerrillas, the chances are that the military force sent on the suppression campaign will be far from adequate for a task in which a ratio of 10 to 1 is prescribed and 500 soldiers to each guerrilla would not be at all excessive. Footnote here. In Cuba, in 1961, more than 60,000 Castro militia were used to suppress an insurgency in the Escombre Mountains supplied by CIA airdrops, involving not more than 600 anti-Castro guerrillas with little or no, uh, no popular support. The ratio of troops to insurgents was thus 100 to 1 or better. The cleanup nevertheless required nearly three months to accomplish. This is not hearsay. The author was there. Main text. Regardless of the number of troops involved, the guerrillas will fight according to certain principles. They will not seek to hold ground or to contend with a stronger force, but only to confuse and exhaust it and to inflict casualties on it without taking casualties in return. The key to this kind of action is the well-placed ambush. Generally, writes Sam Su, he who occupies the field of battle first and awaits his enemy is at ease. He who comes later to the fight and rushes into battle is wary. The guerrillas will not give battle until the terrain favors them. Their effort will be to lure the enemy into situations in which numbers are of little account, because the way is too steep and the passage too narrow for more than a few to proceed at a time. 
When fighting begins, it will be on ground of the Rebels' own choosing, prefer preferably from commanding heights with dense cover and limited visibility, where a few determined men can hold up an army. Ambushes will be prepared in such a manner that a small portion of the advancing military column, its vanguard, will be separated from the rest when firing commences. The fire of the main body of the guerrillas will be concentrated on this vanguard. The object of the ambush must be the complete destruction of the advance group and seizure of its arms and ammunition, the latter task being accomplished while a small guerrilla rear guard delays the rest of the military column. In this connection, Che Guevara writes, when the force of the guerrilla band is small and it is desired above all to detain and slow down the advance of an invading column, groups of snipers from two to ten in number should be distributed all around the column at each of the four cardinal points. In this situation, combat can begun, can be begun, for example, on the right flank. When the enemy centers his action on that flank and fires on it, shooting will begin at that moment from the left flank, at another moment from the rear guard or from the vanguard, and so forth. With a very small expenditure of ammunition, it is possible to hold the enemy in check indefinitely. While the column is delayed, the main body of the guerrilla force quickly gathers, gathers its military booty and moves on toward the next prepared position, or circles around and steps out in a new direction. The snipers withdraw and rejoin the main force before the troops have recovered sufficiently to launch a counterattack, all of this occurring within a matter of a few minutes. The process is repeated again and again. When it has been determined that a military column is sufficiently isolated that the arrival of reinforcements can be delayed for some hours or days, the guerrillas may even attempt an encirclement or may create the appearance of an encirclement by stationing squads of snipers on commanding ground in such a way as to bring the troops under fire in whichever direction they attempt to move. If the troops launch a determined assault, the guerrillas have only to give way, circle around, regroup, and again withdraw. The superior mobility and small size of the guerrilla force are its main assets. The danger that they themselves may be encircled is usually more apparent than real. Night, as Guevara has noted, is the best ally of the guerrilla fighter. Although the Cubans use the phrase encirclement face to describe the look of someone who was frightened. Castro's guerrillas never suffered a single casualty through encirclement, and Guevara considers it no real problem for a guerrilla force. His prescription, take adequate measures to impede the advance of the enemy until nightfall and then exfiltrate, a relatively simple matter for a small group of men in country well known to them, where the cover is good. In the first months of the insurgency, when the army is on the offensive, the tactics of the ambush and evasion are standard and sufficient. The activities of the army itself are enough to advertise the rebel cause. Mounting military casualties cannot be kept secret. The high cost of the anti-guerrilla campaign will be an embarrassment to the government, which will be hard put to explain what it is doing, and failing to do, and each encounter will strengthen the guerrillas while weakening the morale of their military opponents. The guerrilla soldier ought always to have in mind, writes Guevara, that his source of supply of arms is the enemy and that, except in special circumstances, he ought not to engage in a battle that will not lead to the capture of such equipment. The enemy vanguard has made a special target of guerrilla fire for a sound psychological reason. To induce the fear, or at any rate the excessive caution, that will paralyze the will and retard the free movement of the enemy. When the soldiers in the first rank invariably are killed, few will wish to be in the vanguard, and without a vanguard there is no movement. Such reasoning may not always apply to professional troops. Professional officers are trained to accept casualties as the price of battle. Nevertheless, it has been a constant complaint of American military advisors in South Vietnam that the Vietnamese field commanders commonly refuse to advance against strong guerrilla positions without artillery support and preparatory airstrikes that give the Viet Cong guerrillas time to retire from the field. The insurgency continuing, the military may be expected sooner or later to give up the futile pursuit of the guerrilla force and leave to it its wilderness sanctuary if for no other reason than the political. As has been remarked before, few governments can long, can long sustain the political embarrassment of an expensive and well-publicized campaign in which there is no progress to report. Within a matter of weeks or months, the government will be forced to announce a victory, having failed to produce one. The public outside of the war zone will be informed that the insurrection has been suppressed. The bodies of a few civilian casualties may even be displayed by way of evidence, and the troops will be withdrawn to posts and garrisons in more settled territory, falling back on a strategy of containment of the insurrection. If the insurgency is to succeed, the guerrillas must, of course, refuse to be contained. They will now assume the offensive, taking advantage of their new freedom to organize night raids on the small military outposts that ring their free zone. 
Oh, that ring there. Yeah, that ring there frees him. And using the attacks on such outposts as bait to lure military reinforcements into ambush on the roads. As successful action provides more arms, new guerrilla units are organized, and new zones of operations opened. Guerrillas filtering through the army lines attacked isolated military and police units in the villages on the periphery of the free zone, forcing the army to pull back to reinforce these points. With still more room in which to maneuver, rebels occupy the outlying farms, move into small hamlets that cannot be defended economically. Efforts will now be made to discourage, although not absolutely to prevent, military convoys from entering certain zones. The roads will be mined, tank traps dug, defenses in depth constructed, so that the troops will have to fight their way into rebel territory through a series of ambuscades, the guerrillas at each stage offering light resistance and then falling back on the next position. As rebel strength grows, the army is confronted, confronted with a difficult dilemma. Having superior numbers and heavier arms, it will be able to enter the rebel zones in strength, but only at the cost of some casualties and with no advantage, since the ground gained will have no strategic or economic value commensurate with the cost of occupying it. If the troops should remain in force, the guerrillas would simply transfer their operations to another zone. The army cannot be everywhere. Yet if the troops do not remain, the territory is, in effect, ceded to the insurgents, who proceed to turn its agricultural economy and its rural population to their own purpose. This is the dilemma of the military commander. It is, of course, sharpened by political problems. Large chunks of the agricultural economy cannot be surrendered to the insurgents without political consequences. Those whose fortunes are affected, traders, absentee landowners, and the like, will be certain to put pressure on the government to do something. They may seek political alternatives. The general public will be excited and divided by the deterioration of the government's position, as it becomes more apparent. The more radical elements of the urban society will be emboldened. The revolution, excuse me, revolutionary sentiment, stirred up by the underground, will grow stronger and more widespread, and the government will grow progressively more fearful and repressive. In such circumstances, and considering that no army can occupy all of the national territory, the logical and natural course of the regime will be the gradual withdrawal of troops from the countryside to the larger centers of population. The rural areas thus will be slowly and reluctantly surrendered to the insurgents. With expanded resources of manpower and material, the insurgency will continue to grow. As it gains strength, guerrilla bands will become, become guerrilla armies. The larger villages will be captured, the railway bridges will be blown and the highways cut. One by one, the towns and then the cities will be isolated, their vital supplies restricted, civilian transport reduced to a trickle. Military convoys may still come and go, but not without peril, and not with any import and not with any important effect, in a country most of which will already be in the hands of the revolution. The pattern described above is observable. It has already happened in the Western Hemisphere, it is happening right now in Southeast Asia. Certainly, it is not the only pattern that revolutionary warfare can follow. Is the United States itself immune? The complexity of modern, urban, heavily industrialized societies makes them extremely vulnerable to wide-scale sabotage, a fact that has not gone unremarked by the extremists of the small but fin fanatical black nationalist movement in the United States. The extent of their commitment may be judged by the February 1965 disclosure of a bizarre plot said to have been hatched by members of the Black Nationalist Revolutionary Action Movement to blow up the Statue of Liberty in New York, the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia, and the Washington Monument. In the article in Esquire, published just four months earlier, October 1964, entitled The Red Chinese American Negro, the Negro journa journalist William Worthy reported, With an eye unexpected financial and material support from Asia and Africa, RAM has proclaimed the necessity to utilize the three basic principal powers held by Negroes. One, the power to stop the machinery of government. Two, the power to hurt the economy. Three, the power of unleashing violence. The details were clearly spelled out elsewhere by a Negro leader who has since been linked to RAM, writing in the monthly newsletter The Crusader, Robert William, a former chapter president of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People who fled to Cuba after a racial incident in Monroe, North Carolina in 1961, pictured the coming black revolution in the United States in the following terms, quote, When massive violence comes, the USA will become a bedlam of confusion and chaos. The factory, telephone, and radio workers will be afraid to report to their jobs. All transportation will grind to a complete standstill. Essential pipelines will be severed and blown up, and all manner of sabotage will occur. A clash will occur inside the army forces. 
At U.S. military bases around the world, local revolutionaries will side with Afro-GIs. The new concept of revolution defies military science and tactics. The new concept is lightning campaigns conducted in highly sensitive urban uh, communities, with the paralysis reaching the small communities and spreading to the farm areas. The old method of guerrilla warfare, as carried out from the hills and countryside, would be ineffective in a powerful country like the USA. Any such force would be wiped out in an hour. The new concept is to huddle as close to the enemy as possible so as to neutralize his modern and fierce weapons. The new concept dislocates the organs of harmony and, or and order and reduces central power to the level of a helpless, sprawling octopus. During the hours of day, sporadic rioting takes place and massive sniping. Night brings all-out warfare, organized fighting, and unlimited terror against the oppressor and his forces. Such a campaign will bring about an end to oppression and social injustice in the USA in less than 90 days. Williams quotes from an interview which he claims to have had with one Mr. Lumumba, a pseudonym adopted in honor of their murdered Congolese premier, Patrice Lumum Lumumba, a purported underground leader with a plan for guerrilla warfare in the United States. Quote, the United States is very vulnerable, economically and physically. Black youth with the right orientation can stop this entire country. Small bands can damage the eight major dams that supply most of the electricity. Electricity means mass communications. Gasoline can be poured into the sewer systems in major urban areas and then ignited. This would burn out communications lines in an entire city. What would emerge from this chaos? Most likely, guerrilla warfare. I don't think the entire white community will fight, but the entire black community will be fighting. We call the whites cream puffs. We feel that when TV stops, when the telephone no longer rings, their world will almost come to an end. Like during a major air raid, they will stay in the house. They'll sit and wait for television to come on. Can't argue with them there. There is much exaggeration in all of this, and some pure ranting demagoguery, along with what may well be an honest misappraisal of the situation. I'm not sure. As yet, there is no evidence that the Negro minority in the United States is prepared for or disposed to violence, or indeed... What? There's no evidence that the Negro minority in the U.S. is prepared or disposed to violence? Oh, God. It's a phone call. Let's try and wrap this up real quick. All right, just a couple more pages here. Sorry about that. prepared for or disposed to violence, or indeed finds adequate cause. Yet the black nationalists have a point. Where the will to resist authority exists on a wide scale, the means can be found, nor are urban, industrial societies, however well policed, guerrilla proof. The guerrilla succeeds because he survives. He flourishes because his methods are progressive. With a pistol, a machete, or for that matter, a bow and arrow, he can capture a rifle. With 20 rifles, he can capture a machine gun, and with 20 rifles and a machine gun, he can capture a military patrol or destroy a convoy that carries five machine guns and 50,000 rounds of ammunition. With a dozen shovels and a few gallons of gasoline, he can destroy a tank, and with its weapons, he can shoot down an airplane or a helicopter that also carries weapons. Artillery is useless against him because it never catches up with him. A 500-pound aerial bomb will dig a crater 10 feet deep and 15 feet wide, but it will not disturb a gorilla in a slit trench 10 yards away. A dozen aircraft dropping napalm can splash liquid fire over 100 acres of woodland, but it will have no effect unless the gorillas happen to be in that 100 acres, out of the thousands through which they roam. Once the War of the Flea has reached settled rural regions, even these limited means become in ineffective because aircraft cannot attack guerrillas without killing the civilians whose support the government must win, and they all look, li look alike from the air. Great faith was placed in helicopters. They were of service in the Sahara but have failed to come up to expectations in the jungles of Vietnam, where the Viet Cong has learned to set successful traps for them and crew casualties are heavy. United States military handbooks or on irregular warfare techniques discuss various biological and chemical weapons that can be employed against guerrillas. These are recommended especially for situations in which guerrillas have mingled with an innocent civilian population that cannot or ought not to be killed. The object of the so-called biologicals is to induce temporarily incapacitating viral diseases that will reduce the ability of guerrillas to resist attack, so that infantry can rush into a target area and quickly kill or capture them without harming 
transparent page. Arming non-combatants, a device, so to speak, for separating the sheep from the goats. Various non-lethal gases carried, like the biologicals, in artillery shells or aerial bombs or sprayed by low-flying planes or helicopters, have been designed for the same purpose, to, stick, to sicken all within a given target area and so reduce resistance to infantrymen on their arrival without unnecessary bloodshed. The concept is certainly humane and logical. In practice, it has proved faulty. On the three occasions in which, which non-lethal gas, a mixture of vomiting gas and tear gas, of the type used to control rioters, was used in South Vietnam during early 1965, the practical results were nil. Twice the gas simply blew away, without any effect. On the third occasion, it sickened a few residents of the target area, but the infantrymen who soon arrived found no guerrillas in the area. The propaganda effects, on the other hand, were tre tremendous and adverse in the extreme. When Washington casually announced in March 1965 that gas has been used in Vietnam, the political repercussions were heard around the world within 24 hours. The Asian press, especially like excuse me, especially the Japanese, forever scarred by the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs, was loud in indignation. London and Paris made diplomatic inquiries, and much of the U.S. press itself sternly condemned the use of even the most harmless gas as a serious breach of all the civilized conventions of warfare that could lead to who know what barbarity. Considering the great effect of the Chinese charges of germ warfare against the Americans during the Korean War and the fresh outcry against gas, it is doubtful that guerrillas will have much to fear from either gas or biological warfare in the near future, especially since the practical military value remains unproven. Other weapons of modern military technology are more frightening. White phosphorus is invariably crippling, if not fatal, because it burns through to the bone. It will penetrate steel, and nothing extinguishes it but total immersion. A new 1,000-pound parcel bomb opens in the air to, a, to strew a hundred anti-personnel bombs over as many yards, a weapon far more effective against guerrillas than the con concentrated detonation of a single high-explosive missile. New amphibious gun carriers can penetrate the deepest swamps and marshes. Infrared and heat-sensitive sniper scopes detect guerrillas in the dark. A later model operates by magnifying the light of the stars. Mobile radar units can spot infiltrators on the ground at a thousand yards. Silent weapons make the, uh, make the trained guerrilla hunter patrol even harder to detect than guerrillas themselves. Yet when all is said and done, even the counterinsurgency ex experts admit that technology alone can never defeat guerrillas. It can only make their task more difficult and dangerous. The crux of the struggle is the social and political climate. The flea survives by hopping and hiding. He prevails because he multiplies far faster than he can be caught and exterminated. The needs of the gorilla are few, his rifle a blanket, a square of some impermeable material to shelter him from the rain, a knife, a compass, stout boots, the, mim the minimum of ordinary camping equipment. Personal qualifications are greater. Physically, the gorilla must be strong, with iron legs and sound lungs. Temperamentally, he must be a cheerful stoic and an ascetic. He must like the hard life he leads. But what is indispensable is ideological armor. Above all, the revolutionary activist must stand on solid moral ground if he is to be more than a political bandit. One is led to believe, as in the case of the Viet Cong, for example, that guerrillas dominate unprotected rural people by threats and terror. It is a convenient thing for, for country people to say when confronted by government soldiers who ask them why they have sheltered guerrillas. In general, it is not true. There are judicious uses of terror, no doubt, but in guerrilla... But no guerrilla can afford to use it against the people on whose support and confidence he depends for his life as well as for his political existence. People are quick to detect the difference between opportunism and dedication, and it is the latter that they respect and follow. To be successful, the guerrilla must be loved and admired. To attract followers, he must represent not merely success but absolute virtue, so that his, so that his enemy will represent absolute evil. If the soldiers are idle, drunken, and licentious, Licentious. The guerrilla must be vigorous, sober, and moral. If enemies are disposed of, it must be for moral reasons. They must be traitors, murderers, rapists. The revolution, revolution must show that its justice is sure and swift. By contrast, its enemies must be revealed as venal, weak, and vacillating. The successful guerrilla leader must be fair in his dealings, paying for the goods he takes, and respecting personal property and individual rights. 
even those of persons not partisan to his cause, in the realization that the society in which he works is an intricate and interlocking machinery and that he requires all the support he can get, even where the war is at bottom a class struggle, and this is not always the case, class rivalries should be softened rather than sharpened, subordinated to a transcendental national cause, though the adherents at the ring must be given a clear moral choice. They must be told, in effect, it is still not too late to join forces with virtue and to revolution. Guerrilla leaders do not inspire the spirit of sacrifice and revolutionary will that create popular interaction by promises alone or by guns alone. A high degree of selfless dedication purpose is required. Whether the primary cause of revolution is nationalism or social justice or the anticipation of material progress, the decision to fight and to sacrifice is a social and a moral decision. Insurgency is thus a matter not of manipulation but of inspiration. I am aware that such conclusions are not compatible with the with the picture of guerrilla operations and guerrilla motivation drawn by the counterinsurgency theorists who are so much in vogue today, but the counterinsurgency experts have yet to win a war. At this writing, they are certainly losing one. Their picture is distorted because their premises are false and their observation faulty. They assume, perhaps their commitments require them to assume, that politics is mainly a manipulative science and insurgency mainly a politico-military technique to be countered by some other technique whereas both are forms of social behavior, the latter being the mode of popular resistance to unpopular governments. That concludes Chapter 10, War of the Flea.